Good morning, everyone. We're going to continue in our studies about who and what God has made us in His Son. We're talking about how it is that God operates today uh, in the lives of believers, the program that God has given us, if you will, to walk under is, is under His grace. We, we're not under the law today as believers, members of the body of Christ, but we're under God's grace. And we're talking about what it means to live under grace. We're talking about how it is that we access by faith the grace that God has given us to stand in and the faith walk of believers. And that's different, very different from what uh, most churches teach a Christian, how a Christian is to live. Most of what Christi uh, Christianity, religion teaches about the walk of the believer is a performance system. And it's a system of, of uh, performing or modifying our behavior and it's, it's really not much more than psychology. Uh, now, psychology is a study of, of um, if you will, our old nature and how our old nature operates and manipulating uh, the, our minds uh, by uh, different types of uh, methods that psychology uses. And unfortunately, uh, many uh, Christian ministries will use psychology to try to teach the believer how it is that they're to walk. The thing, the problem with that is, is the Bible talks about a spiritual transformation in the life of the believer that takes place by accessing by faith what it is God has made us in His Son, and we're to access by faith the change that God has worked in us, the work that God has performed upon us as believers. Uh, is it happens the moment we trust the gospel that God has transformed us, it regenerated, made alive our spiritual nature. It's we're not reforming our spiritual nature. God has regenerated it with His Holy Spirit by linking us or joining us. We're in, we live in living union with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're uh, we have this uh, spiritual. Uh, union with the Lord Jesus Christ, that God the Holy Spirit takes the spiritual words of this book and he, we by faith access the life that God has given us to walk and we're to walk by faith putting on the inner man or the inward man. And there are many references in Paul's epistles to uh, the, for example, we're to uh, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, the reference to we have the mind of Christ. Uh, there's uh, renewing our mind. We're encouraged to renew our minds. And these, this, it, all these references are talking about the body of truth known as the faith in Paul's epistles. Uh, we're to put on this body of doctrine. We're to we're to be established, built up in the doctrine. Let the Word of God build us up and build up our inner man to a maturity, a condition where it's mature and able to function and understands how to operate in good times and in bad times. We have access by faith to this body of doctrine called the faith, the body of truth God's given to us as members of the body of Christ. And this doctrine and truth is, is different from the rest of the Word of God. And so we have a body of doctrine Doctrine, not, we're not under the law. Paul's very clear to, to explain that as believers, we're not under a performance program under a law of conditional blessings and curses. Instead, we're to walk as full-grown adult children, uh, accessing by faith the status of sons and the, and the righteousness God has made us in His Son to walk in that. And so we're to, we're to study to understand the program that God would have us to understand who and what He's made us in His Son and let that truth live in us when we access it by faith. It's not our job to make that truth live in our, 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 in our minds. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. We're to by faith believe that when we walk and submit to the truth of God's word for us, that, it'll, that God's responsibility is to make that live in us and work in us. The life of Christ, you know, you, it's impossible for us to live the Christian life. Christ has to live his life in us. That's his job. So we don't have to live the Christian life. We just have to accept by faith that we have this living union with the Lord Jesus Christ and let the truth of his word renew our minds. And God the Holy Spirit does not work apart from the word of God. He never has. God the Holy Spirit has always worked 
through his word. And if you look at how, even under the law pr program, how individuals walked, you don't see the type of superstitious activity that the church or the, the again, Christians, Christendom teaches in most churches that God is manipulating the believer's circumstances in order to make their life rosy and, 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 and if they would just live in submission by bringing the tithe and, and, and having perfect attendance and, and by doing all the things that, that tradition teaches believers there to do in order to have God's acceptance and favor that God in turn will give them uh, will well you've, you've heard of um, uh, the idea of prosperity preaching okay with prosperity preaching the idea is that if you don't have a big fancy house and if you don't have new automobiles in your driveway and if you don't uh, if you don't have a, a great career that you, somehow you're failing and, and God is not able to reward you in your life with those things but if you would find out how it is that you can uh, tithe correctly or, or live according to the standard God's given us to, uh, to walk under then God would bless you with those things in your life and that's prosperity preaching. Many churches teach that. They fill up the, their, their church buildings with people coming in order to, uh, to gain that type of prosperity of others in the congregation, thinking that the, other, the rest of the congregation uh, are living this high lifestyle because of God's blessing. And when we, when we realize that is not Bible, that is not what the Word of God says for believers in time past or today in this age of grace, but instead uh, what God is doing in our lives is a faith walk and so we we're learning how getting into God's Word and getting established uh, helps us to, to learn about who and what God has made us so that we can access those things by faith in our lives as Christians our Christian life is based on learning who and what God has already made us in the Lord and when we, and then walking in those promises and blessings is is putting on uh, the inward man. It's 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 put, uh, renewing our minds with that understanding. As believers, we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, if you're in Second Corinthians, look at chapter five. Hold your place in Second Corinthians twelve and look at chapter five. Um, we we looked at this last week. Now he that wrought us for the self same thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we're at home in the body we are absent from the Lord so there's this understanding that God the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to give us about a promise of our hope our blessed hope verse 7 and he reminds us of this for we walk by faith and not by sight we are confident I say that's that confident expectation of a sure thing. That's the hope that the Bible talks about that we have in Christ. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that we, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So we have some understanding and it changes our minds in our circumstances. That's how God works in the believer today. It's, it is uh, intervention. And it is power of uh, empowerment, if you will, but it's just not the same intervention and empowerment that the world talks about in superstition and that uh, the, the pagans believed their gods would help them win in battle and so forth. They believed in uh, pleasing the gods so that they would have blessings. And that's the superstitious idea that most Christians have about how God operates changing their circumstances and not about how God uses his word to change us. And when we are changed in any circumstances, we should be able to have joy, rejoicing, and victory, realizing, setting our affections on things above. <clears throat> we talked a uh, little bit about this last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul uh, had this thorn in the flesh, and he prayed that the Lord remove it from him. And God's answer to him in verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, as a result, Paul 
Paul appreciates what God's telling him here, that the blessings that he has in Christ, the grace that God, that God showed the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and the salvation that he gave him, the hope that he has in Christ, the life that he has in Christ, that is the grace of God that was shown to the Apostle Paul, the measure of grace that the Apostle Paul received, the revelation that, that, the, that God revealed to Paul about his grace and about this dispensation of grace that we live in and God's purpose for the church, the body of Christ, for the, uh, for the hope that we have, for the, uh, the idea that we have purpose. God has a purpose for our lives for eternity. We're a part of a big plan that God has to accomplish in eternity that will be a, a plan that God will receive eternal glory, but we'll be a part of that eternal glory that God has living and, and reigning with Christ in the heavenly places. So there's this, there's this grace that God had given, th revealed to Paul, and Paul says, uh, he told Paul his grace was sufficient for him in that thorn in the flesh that, he, that, was, uh, that Paul suffered from, instead of telling him, I'll remove the thorn as you prayed in faith. We know the Apostle Paul prayed in faith, believing God could deliver him. We know it wasn't a, a situation where Paul didn't have enough faith, and that's why God didn't remove the thorn in the flesh. And the answer, Paul says, as a result, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, not for my infirmities, but I will rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's what we want as believers. We want the power of Christ to rest upon us. We want that power. That's the result of accessing by faith the grace that God's given to us. That He told Paul that, that it's sufficient. It's all he needs. And so uh, you read down, look at the list uh, that Paul's talking about. He's going to glory in his infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon him. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, <clears throat> in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. So the Apostle Paul's talking about a, a walk of strength, that when the circumstances make him weak, his inner man is strong because he's standing on the solid foundation of the grace that God's given him to stand in. The foundation of knowing who and what God has made him in Christ gives him power and gives him strength. And that is what we need. The, the problem is, if in those weaknesses and in those infirmities, all the believer is praying for is, God, please remove this infirmity. Please heal me from this problem. <clears throat> They're not renewing their mind about who and what what God has already made them in Christ. They're not thinking about the perfect, complete salvation that they have in Christ. God has already provided all of our need in Christ. And so they're not going to be transformed by the renewing of their mind if the only thing they can pray to and utter to God is, heal me of this infirmity. They're not accessing by faith the grace God's given for them to stand in. And we're going to talk about how it is that we access God's grace and His strength in our walk in spite of our circumstances as we go on uh, in, the, in this series. So the Apostle Paul wasn't referring to God granting him some divine intervention or, or power, special power or grace. But there is intervention of God, and there is power that God gives us in the way God does operate today. A lot of people, they think, well, you know, there goes my prayer life. Everything that I ever prayed for was, give me this, give me that, give me this, help them, help, help, help this person, and help us all uh, from our problems, and help us to, and, and that's, that's okay to pray for those things. Uh, in fact, go to, go to Philippians 4 with me now. Uh, Philippians 4 is the chapter <clears throat> that, <clears throat> or the passage, I should say, beginning in verse... I want you to look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now, verse 4, the apostle of the Gentiles isn't telling the church, the body of Christ, <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord when you can. He isn't saying, 
when everything is going well, remember to rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't say that. But instead, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Was the bed, uh, or was the walk, the, the Apostle Paul walked as our Apostle in, this li- in his earthly ministry, you know, in his lifetime, uh, living out his apostleship, and walking from city to city, was it a, was it a life of, of rejoicing because everything was rosy in his Christian life? We know the Apostle Paul probably lived one of the most difficult ministries of any prophet in the Scriptures. Save the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. The Apostle Paul endured more hardship, stonings, and difficulty. Yet, remember when he was in jail in Philippi? Remember he was beaten, and they, he and Silas lay in stocks down in the prison? And you remember them? They were singing hymns. Those were not hymns of woe and and hymns of sorrow. Those were hymns of rejoicing in what they had in Christ. And the result was it converted the the jailer. After the earthquake, of course, Saul and Silas could have fled as prisoners, but they they remained. And so that the jailer was so relieved because he would have been put to death, losing prisoners. And he realized there's something different about these guys. They're not running from the persecution and difficulty that they've endured. They're standing and rejoicing and singing hymns. You know, I want to find out what it is that they believe in. And he was converted uh, in his house. So the, the, the illustrations that we have are to mind the things, but in this passage, we're admonished, again, verse 4, to rejoice in the Lord always. And verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything, that would be everything, Okay, just like always is always, but in everything by prayer and supplication, notice, prayer and supplication, making requests, right? The Apostle Paul tells us it's okay to make requests with prayer and, but notice the type of prayer that Paul is teaching the Philippians here. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That is the key word in verse 6. It's not that he was telling them, uh, hey, you know, when, when you're having difficulty in everything, pray. They, they were probably already praying in their difficulties when he told them that. But here's the point he was trying to make. Pray with thanksgiving. Why is that so important to pray with thanksgiving? Because when you take inventory of the blessings that God has already given you in Christ, that transform renews your mind. And that's where, if you read down the passage, you see the, what he was trying to teach them. Um, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And notice the promise, verse 7. And all your problems are going to be worked out. All your, all your circumstances are going to be changed. That's not the promise in verse 7. The promise is, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's what they needed. There's no promise in the scriptures that God is going to deliver His people, the saints, in time past or today, from difficulties and circumstances because He told Adam and Eve that because of the curse, that they would they would toil all their lives but the sweat of their face they would eke out their living because of the curse upon creation <clears throat> that hasn't changed but the walk of faith recognizing how god has equipped us as believers to endure any problems to be soldiers who can endure hardship to endure whenever we're, we have ministry and opportunity and, and we receive persecution or rejection. We're to be able to endure in all of our circumstances in our lives. When we're fulfilling our purpose in this life as the heads of families or maybe uh, as, as, a, <clears throat> um, as the, 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 uh, raising our, our children or in working our jobs and fulfilling our roles in our life, Uh, to serve the Lord in whatever station of life we've been given to walk in. No matter what the vocation that we... to earn a living, to support our families, uh, 
we're to serve the Lord in, in that capacity. And when we, when we do those things, the peace of God, when we do so with thanksgiving, recognizing we are who we are in Christ, the Lord gives us a peace that passes understanding. Now, understanding what that says, the peace of God that passes understanding, that's not because we don't understand what we're being thankful for, but the peace, the, the, with, if you talk to somebody, for example, who do, doesn't understand living under grace, and you tell them, well, you know, I have prayed about my circumstances, uh, and I have prayed with thanksgiving, and God has given me a peace about this problem. Oh, great, he's told you that he's going to work things out for you. No, I, with, without the understanding, without God changing my circumstances, I'm rejoicing in who and what God has made me in his son. And I have comfort and peace that no matter what the result of my circumstances, God loves me and he's for me. And this isn't the, the finger of God to try to to correct me or teach me or chastise me. I understand by the scriptures that God is for me and God is with me in this situation, comforting and giving me and giving me strength that I can endure this hardness. I have a hope that has given me comfort. And, and those things are promised to the believer that the peace of God that passes the understanding, it's not that our situation has changed, but in our circle, in infirmities, in our, our, our distresses, in the circumstances of life, God will give us peace and strength to stand as adult children of God, giving Him praise for the comfort and the peace that only He can give us. The God of comfort and the God of all peace can give us. Look at verse 8, eight now. Notice the things that that he's admonishing the Philippians to think about. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, can you think of some things about who and what God's made you in Christ that are true and that are honest? Whatsoever things are just, you may not find justice in this world, but you've been justified, declared righteous in Christ. God is just, and God is your Father, and, and all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to His purpose. In that passage, there is, some, there is a hope that we have as believers, that we know that after this life, all things work together for good. God's purpose is going to be accomplished, no matter what the circumstances we're going through are in this world. Uh, so what the, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, when, when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no purer uh, person that's ever lived. The, uh, we, we, purity. The things that God says are pure for us to think about in this life. Those things that were to set our affections on things above. The pure things. Set our affections on those things, not the things of this world. Whatsoever things are lovely. Now, you may have the pleasure uh, of having a perfect marriage and you know that may be your wife you know the lovely thing there right but you can be thankful for the people in your life that God has sent to be a blessing and a comfort to you and no doubt we're to be thankful for, for those persons in our lives that make this life and uh, manageable and help us to make this life better but think about the lovely things in God's Word that he has for you that are God is faithful. He'll never leave nor forsake you. He's promised his love for you. His love is consistent. It's, it's, it's unconditional. And it'll, he'll never leave or forsake you. Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The ver things of virtue, the things that God has given you. Paul's talking about the things that you're to think on. If you set your affections on those things, I mean, Paul wasn't just trying to use a thesaurus to think of all the different ways of things, saying things that are good here. Each one of the, he had a purpose and a meaning for the, and he's referring to the doctrine, the body of faith, the body of truth, that tells us who and what God has made us. And he tells us that's what we're supposed to be thinking on and to be thankful for in whatever our infirmities are, in whatever our circumstances are. 
and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds. Those things, verse 9, which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Do those things. I mean, if, you, if you're not sure what the list in verse 8 is about, verse 9 kind of seals it there. Those are the things that you've learned through your apostle. Romans through Philemon. The things that he's taught us, how God loves us, who he's made us, this, the, the, the way God looks upon us through his son. He sees us as complete in, in his son. Verse 8, he says... I'm sorry, verse 9. Those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So the, the peace, that's what we all need. In a world that's wrought with... with uh, uh, there's, you watch the news and you see the condition our, our country is in, our people are in. Uh, you see the turmoil that's going on around us, uh, political turmoil. Uh, you see all the, the different problems and crises in the world that the world is going through. Uh, you see all the, uh, the, the difficulty and the hardship, but then at home uh, you, you have anxiety, concerns about the future, uh, what, what's the world going to be like in the next five, ten years. Maybe you are uh, anxious over things that are going on with loved ones and other difficulties in your life. We're to think on these things for peace. And that's what, we're talking about doctrine, learning some things that, to establish us as believers. But it's not, it's not just stuffy doctrine that doesn't have any function in our, in our real lives. In our, uh, you, know, you might think, well, what is, how is that going to help me solve my problem over here to, to study these things? But that's where we, we, we get so focused and Christianity is so focused on the things of this world that they're not realizing the importance of knowing that the things that God has made us in His Son transcend this world. We're established in those things. Those things are going to live in us not only here but in the ages to come. And that there's a, we're, we're eternal creatures. We have eternal life. We need to start thinking with the way God tells us that we should think about this world. It, it's not our home. We have the hope of better things that he's promised, promised us. And those things, we can access that life that God has given us in Christ right now. We're going to close here and pick up here again next time.